Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to panel three of the uh, Building Bridge, Bridging uh, Building uh, Bridges Conference. As some of you already know, today is the second day of our four-day-long virtual conference uh, organized by researchers from Nottingham Trent University's Post-Colonial Studies Center in collaboration with Nottingham's Bonington Gallery. Uh, my name is Purna Chandra Naik, and I'm a PhD student uh, in the School of Arts and Humanities here at NTU. Uh, and it is my privilege to chair this wonderful panel titled Resistance, Representation and Marginalized Communities. While violence inflicted in multiple forms through the colonial structure of power is far from over and its brutal legacies very much stress, stretch into the present, colonialism or more specifically British colonialism in South Asia must be confronted along with and in, and in relation to quote-unquote local or pre-colonial axis of oppression such as the caste system. Colonialism, which treated people, their labor and natural resources as fodder in its profit-making mission, must also be seen in conjunction with the contemporary project of neoliberalism, sugar-coated with the charm of developmentalism. The papers in this panel are preoccupied with some of these critical and difficult questions. But equally importantly, the presenters draw our attention to how the oppressed and marginalized people have always challenged and resisted the structures of oppression. I would like to briefly introduce the presenters uh, and their papers now. First, we have Shifana Pie, uh, who is presenting uh, her paper titled uh, Alternate History, a Representation of Indian Partition in Political Cartoons. Uh, Shifana P.A. is a doctoral research fellow uh, in the Postgraduate and Research Development, uh, uh, Postgraduate and Research Department of English, St. Thomas College, Corin uh, Mahatma Gandhi University in India. She is uh, currently working on alternate history a study of Indian political cartoons. She holds an MPhil degree in English literature and language. Uh, and uh, uh, MPhil degree is titled uh, Caricaturing the Political, a critical historical sketch of Indian editorial cartoons. Then we have uh, MD Alamgir Hossein, who is presenting uh, a paper titled Neoliberal Development, Environmental Disaster and Temporal Resistance in Indra Sinha's Animals People. Uh, MD Alamgir Hussain is a graduate student uh, in English at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, he is currently working on his dissertation tentatively titled Neoliberal Development, Environmental Degradation and Resistance in Contemporary South Asian Anglophone Fiction. His research interests include post-colonial theory and literature, diaspora literature, world literature, and the environmental humanities. Then we have Bianca Cheraches. Uh, her paper is uh, titled Caste, Gender, and, Rep and Re Resistance, The Evolution of Dalit Women's Identity in Baby Kamblais, The Prisons We Broke, and Mina Kandasamy's The Gypsy Goddess. Bianca Cherches is a part-time lecturer at the Department of English and German Philology uh, at the University of Saragossa in Spain. She graduated in English Philology from the University of Saragossa and she holds a master's degree in English Studies in Secondary Education from the same university. She, she wrote her PhD thesis on the Dalit community and the representation in, in Indian uh, literature written in English. And then finally, we have a, a jointly uh, written paper by Chithira James and Dr. Reju George Matthew. Their paper is titled uh, Discriminatory Social Orders and Subaltern Assertion, a comparative study of resistance in selected Dalit and Burakami literature. Chithira James is a research scholar uh, in English, in the National Institute of Technology, Calicut, Kerala, in India, from December 2019. Prior to this, she, she has undertaken MPhil research 
in the Gandhi Gram Rural Institute in Din Dindigul in Tamil Nadu, where she researched on vegan feminist studies and human animal engagement. Uh, Reju George Matthew is an assistant professor uh, in English in the National Institute of Technology, Calicut in Kerala. Uh, he, his research interests include religious studies, colonial modernity, Dalit Christianity, and identity formations. Uh, he has been a Dad Exchange Scholar. Uh, uh, in 2011, in um, Technische Universität Dresden, Germany. Please excuse my German. So uh, after the pre presentation, we will move on to the Q and A. Please put your questions uh, on the YouTube chat or email. Email them to buildingbridges at the rate ntu.ac.uk. Please note that this event includes live automated closed captioning and that this may include some mistakes. Once again, I welcome you all and thank you for joining us. I hope you like the presentations and engage in the discussions afterwards. Thank you very much. Hi, all. I'm uh, Shifana P. from the Postgraduate and Research Department of English, St. Thomas College, Karancheri, India. Uh, it is a real privilege to speak here today in this international conference about um, alternate history, representation of uh, Indian political cartoons. In the history of India, Indo-Pak partition was the most significant event, which was uh, followed by migration on both sides of the border. The riots, the victimization, and large-scale killing of the people followed uh, the event of partition. Over the past decades, since India's partition, many literary and non-literary fictions and non fictions academic texts were, uh, have been produced to uh, describe the event, make meaning of the event, and understand the event. Historians have documented minute details of the negotiations and compromises that had taken place uh, between the Indian political leaders like Gandhi, Jinnah, Nehru, Patel, etc. and also between the uh, British uh, when the decision of partition was uh, realized. Literature has also been produced about the faulty boundaries uh, drawn hastily on the eastern and the western parts of the country. Conventional historical literature about partition uh, has profusely dealt with the subject of violence. Uh, to giving estimates of how many women were raped uh, and abducted and how many people died and trying to seek these incidents as if uh, they were sudden acts of frenzy. Partition research has generally concentrated on uh, critical readings of the uh, literary text, leaving an evident gap in the genre. And this particular paper intends to supplement the genre of partition studies uh, by incorporating the medium of political cartoons as a popular cultural representation uh, that uh, visualize the dreadful event with a unique combination of language and interpretation. The political cartoons uh, represent a unique model of um, uh, of uh, accessing socio-political events and uh, produces the narratives uh, that can be read as both representations of and interventions into the discourses. Historians have long used political cartoons as a source of evidence. And this paper will uh, present a historical investigation into the production of political cartoons as an alternate history in the context of the communal riots and migration brought about by India's partition. And this is accompanied by viewing Mm, this is accompanied by uh, 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 by um, uh, viewing um, cartoons as a cultural uh, vital cultural text on par with another uh, on uh, on par with an, uh, other fictional and non fictional um, narratives of uh, partition. The cartoons articulate instability uh, lines indiscriminable under the grab of uh, mythical solidarity, various uh, various political ideologies. Hence, uh, the idea of a 
public uh, in a cultural form invokes a genre of cartoons uh, that uh, problematizes the uh, human impact of uh, socio politics by constructing the publics and the counter publics that is the interpretative communities uh, bound by a visual experience thus the political cartoons can be seen as highly complex modern uh, attempts to formulate uh, the visual identities under specific historical and political conditions that resonate with the uh, reading public uh, let us uh, for example consider the uh, following illustration let me uh, share my screen with you mm. let me share my screen um uh, this cartoon uh, congrophobia which is appeared in the hindustan times uh, on uh, 30 20th of march 1946 conveys that the muslim league as represented by jinnah is uh, bereft of political powers and ultimately scared of uh, congress uh, the hindustan times has a word for it congrophobia the neologism is uh, striking uh, uh, for phobia uh, which is uh, medically defined as a type of uh, anxiety disorder that causes an individual to experience extreme uh, irrational fear about a situation living creature a place or an object consequently with in the overall context of the cartoon uh, this neologism engages in a parodic upturn of the medical definition Uh, for jinna in reality may not be suffering from the symptom of congrophobia a non existent disease um, only apparent in the imagination of the nationalist media a pervasive image of jinna uh, experiencing a panic attack in sorts is uh, given however most intriguing is uh, jinna similarity to the protagonist of uh, edward munch's uh, expressionistic painting the scream representing how we see our age racked with anxiety and uncertainty although this particular cartoon is a response to jinnah's comment on accompanying the illustration is this that most fear which one uh, consider as being conducive to the opting of negotiations um, between two major nations in the country jinnah on the captured mission um, the cartoon's depiction contradict jinnah's points of view by presenting jinna as a paranoid individual uh, subject to irrational and exaggerated uh, fear the cartoon uh, skillfully authorizes him uh, and suggests that muslim obduracy in the face of the cabinet mission is put to strike uh, a balance between the all india muslim league and the congress is in actuality a sign of a disease that requires medical care and the behavioral therapy and the equivocation concerning the position of the congress and the muslim league in the face of the indian independence and the prospect of the pakistan continues well into 1947 in another cartoon titled you ask for it published in the um, civil and military gazette following the 3rd june plan or the mount patton plan is for us one of the most remarkable cartoons documenting the uh, political drama of the partition the plan accepted by all the major political formations of the time including the uh, uh, congress the muslim league and the akhalas sealed the fate of the india's uh, partition prospect the cartoon provides a biting criticism of the political happenings mm, and uh, the iconography of the cartoon has um, invoked uh, the biblical uh, scapegoat myth um, in which a goat is sent to uh, uh, the desert symbolically burdened with the sins of the people by the uh, jewish priest india or the people of india is here depicted as an unwitting uh, voiceless animal butchered by um, mount batten and its friend uh, the most coveted session is carried out by uh, fa by nehru who leaves behind the posterior for jinnah to take the cartoon in its miniature form implicate the three foremost political leaders whose conniving had led to india's partition the absence of ordinary people in the butchering scene is also significant and it it support the uh, portraying nehru walking away with the head uh, reinforces uh, the widely held view uh, that the congress uh, more generally and um, a small group of um, 
Congressmen like by Nehru, in particular, were the force behind the acceptance of the partition plan. In another cartoon published in the Hindustan Times, um, you know, we witness a critical, uh, a explicit uh, critic of um, Mountbatten and the colonial um, government through him. Titled, uh, Sorry, Jens, there's no menu. Story, sorry, Jens, there's no menu. Uh, uh, what will you have? The illustration features Mountbatten asking the trio of the Indian leaders compromising uh, the Muslim Jinnah, uh, Hindu Nehru, and a Sikh with uh, embodied religious markers, but uh, what, what they would uh, like to have. Uh, the possibility of a myriad uh, uh, of options of comestible, comestibles on the menu uh, is, however, an eye wash uh, for the customers. I later uh, informed that the only available dish that could be served is um, cabinet mission pudding, uh, Mount, Mountbatten's inculturation in the restaurant server role with the customary politeness of waiter simultaneously suggest uh, his role as a representative of the colonial governments uh, merely communicating their uh, wishes uh, and uh, as a willful uh, partisan in their innegotiable deal of territorially partitioning India along the um, allegiance lines. In uh, the fulfillment of mission, published in Pioneer on the 13th of July, 1947, we see a scruffy, scrawny lion with a bandage displaying the name Atli. Uh, around his head, stationed between two huge combating elephants signifying uh, Hindu India and Hindu, um, sorry, uh, Muslim India. The representative of the empire is seen almost uh, collapsing in the adamantine pressure exerted by the communal Hindu and Muslim factions. And at least in uh, no mood to resolve their differences or, uh, or to tame them, being only too willing to, to resign his office to jettison uh, all responsibility. Exasperated, he declares, no more of that I'm leaving. Having realized that exit was the only viable option, the important imperial lion is forced to fight uh, flight in the phase of uh, phase to uh, determine the differences between the uh, religious um, factions in India that were impossible for them uh, to resolve. One thing that strikes us in the previous uh, and in this illustration is the uh, way the cartoon dramatizes the political tension between colonial India with its mammoth population of uh, Hindus and Muslims and subverts the quintessential icon of the British lion, much popularized by the punch cartoonists like a lion John Tenniel. Punch regularly pictures imperial politics and in particular caricatures colonial India. Uh, the lion, the tiger, the poison, and the colonia, uh, visual tropes. Are the visual tropes apparent in um, cartoons documenting the human experience of colonial politics? One such cartoon that uses animalization to uh, critique uh, the colonial politics um, is John Tenniel's The British Lion's Venetians on the Bengal Tiger, which is published in uh, Punch uh, on uh, 22nd of August, 1857. Yet another cartoon titled um, Frankenstein, the, uh, which was published in the Hindustan Times on 20th March, 1947. Uh, the subject of this cartoon is the communal violence unleashed by the prospect of India's partition. And uh, the cartoon performs the task of propaganda through visual syntax by evading uh, the very material nature of the violence that uh, devastated continent in uh, 1947 and uh, brutalizing Jinnah's position instead of control um, and a violence. The distinction between the text and the nod uh, and the illustration is stark. Uh, the text says Mr. Jinnah has broken his long silence on the Punjab happenings to uh, extort the majority community to remind their responsibility to the minority and offer to protect them. The illustration shares no corresponding equivalence with the text and instead derides it brutally. The stress here upon uh, is upon the character of Jinnah and as Dr. Frankenstein, the eponymous 
protagonist of Mary Shelley's Gothic novel, standing next to huge uh, coffin, meekly directing with his forefinger, uh, forefinger to uh, at communal bestiality, uh, the monster he has revived. to return to its casket the relationship of hierarchy between the creator jinn and the creation the monster is rendered uh, as skew as an incensed monster brandishing a club is visibly uh, disinclined uh, to follow uh, the instructions from the creator and the cartoon is uh, rendered uh, more incisively uh, by further invocation of the evil uh, as we see an old man a devil presumably uh, witnessing the scene with a relish uh, standing next to the door that is marked as jinnah's laboratory despite the economy of expression the cartoon is an example of the graphic propaganda accomplished without equivocation the disequilibrium between the tech as the strategy employed by uh, to translate and testify jinna as a stereotype mm, uh, i'm concluding my uh, paper uh, that is a discussion of the political cartoons by the indian nationalist press suggests that to subjective in nature and ideologically apparent Uh, these cartoons form a site of a uh, lasting discourse of uh, partition historiography uh, the visual syntax of symbols uh, and the uh, social figures that animate the cartoons nuance and interpret the contours of politics and in doing so initiate uh, the debate and manipulate the public consciousness uh, nevertheless uh, despite its upward communicativeness these political cartoons from uh, 1946 to 1947 have officially criticized the trauma and tragedy of the partition and the indian independence and thereby bequeath as with a complex historical inheritance and although the pop problematic and subscribed by ideological binaries this visual legacy of cartoons uh, enable us uh, to engage with the history uh, of the south asian subcontinent uh, and, and and use uh, that critical understanding to confront uh, our past of violent communalism territorial partition and problematic nationalism and prevent it from uh, repeating itself so uh, here ends my presentation thank you my paper new liberal development environmental disaster and temporal resistance in indra sinha's annual speakful examines how sinha engages with the temporal to question and resist new liberal development that thrives at the cost of humans and the environment in wasted lives modernity and its outcasts jigman bowman argues that human waste is an inescapable side effect of economic progress brought about by modernization for bowman the modernizing niche of the globe turned the so called backward and underdeveloped parts of the world into ready made dumping sites for the human waste of modernization this transformation of some parts of the globe into dumping sites is made possible by the power differential continuously reproduced by the stark inequality of development economically and technologically advanced nations in the name of assisting poor countries to develop their economic conditions manipulate strategies to get rid of their wastes by transferring them to low income countries a glaring example of such strategies can be found in lawrence summers's leaked memo of 1991 where he advocated dumping a load of toxic wastes in the lowest wage country for the economic benefit of both rich and poor nations the logic of economic development via exporting dirty industries to poor countries obfuscates the unequal power relations governing modern trade practices and counsels the concomitant risks arising from the transnational trade of hazardous substances in this presentation i analyze the ways sinha's animals people resists the tendency of such a logic to obscure the attendant effects of pollution trade and the asymmetrical power relations that it entails by looking at economic development from a temporal perspective 
I argue that by situating the personal and collective past of the environmental subaltern in relation to the present and the future, Sina creates temporal relationality that exposes the fallacy inherent in the neoliberal logic of economic development via transfer of toxic wastes. The notion of economic development via pollution trade being capitalist in nature primarily focuses on the present. The capitalist project profit and the exact use of time are linked together. This capitalist relationship between profit and time can be expressed by the dictum as E.P. Thompson puts it bluntly, time is money. Since the past cannot generate capitalist profit and the future is not yet available for use, the logic of pollution trade seeks to exploit the present to the maximum. Because of its presentist attitude, this notion of economic development fails to situate development within a broader context of time and leaves unexamined the cumulative economic effects of colonial power, that is of the still working mechanisms of disposition, displacement and death that facilitate the expropriation of the productive capacity of the lands and bodies of the others of Europe. In Animals People, Sinha uses analepsis, prolepsis, and allusions to create what Seymour Chapman calls internal chronologic and thus resist the tendency of the Western discourse on pollution trade to naturalize the cumulative economic effects of neocolonial power in developing countries. At the backdrop of Sinha's novel lies the historical Bhupal disaster of 1984. Sinha fictionalizes the aftermath of the tragedy the victims prolonged the struggle to survive the disaster and the attitude of Union Carbide towards the victims to illustrate how transnational companies through pollution trade capitalize on the environment of the South in the name of development. In Sinha's fiction, animals people represent the fictionalized survivors of the disaster and the infamous company refers to the US multinational company Union Carbide that did not even care to appear before an Indian court for a hearing. The operation of the US company in India and its response to the disaster require rethinking development and pollution trade by going beyond the traditional notion of pollution trade as transnational shipment of toxic wastes. The circumstances under which Indian carbide started its operation in India could be traced back to the country's efforts to modernize its agricultural sector in the post-independence era. With a view to increasing its food production, India adopted the Green Revolution in the late 1960s and 1970s. As part of the revolution, it replaced its indigenous seeds with high yielding varieties of seeds that demanded improved irrigation and the use of chemical fertilizers for increased production. High yielding crops were less resistant to pests and hence required more use of pesticides than their progenitors. It is against this backdrop of changes in Indian agricultural sector that Union Carbide started its transnational production of pesticide in Bhopal. To reduce the manufacturing cost, the company used methyl isocyanate, MIC, a highly toxic chemical in its production of the pesticide. As a result, when the gas leak occurred, MIC along with other gases came out of the plant and wreaked its havoc on humans and the environment. Justin Omar Johnson sees a connection between MIC, Green Revolution, and US interference in Indian economy. He observes, I quote, as a vital compound in the production of many popular pesticides, as well as rubber and adhesives, MIC embodies the legacy of the Green Revolution and the US attempt to revamp India's economy via a high-tech agriculture corporate investment and local debt, end quote. Johnson also notes that in the early 1960s, petrochemical companies from the United States were beginning to technologically colonize the economies of India and elsewhere under the humanitarian banner of the Green Revolution. This, the pesticide factor in Bhopal could be regarded as an extension of this colonizing enterprise. Although Sinha does not explicitly point to the Green Revolution in India, his references to the gas leak, MIC, and the American company invite the reader to reflect on the disaster in relation to a broader context of development espoused by the West. Sina places the disaster in relation to agricultural modernization propagated and exported by the West. As Union Carbide started its operation in Bhopal to fulfill the promise of Green Revolution, it 
quote, routinely promised to increase by many times the annual crop yield of India, which was seen as the first condition for lifting the country out of its post-colonial dependency, end quote. However, this apparently benevolent gesture of the company raises questions about the sincerity of its noble intention. If the company really had good intentions of helping India get out of its post-colonial dependency, why didn't it produce the pesticide in the USA and later export it to India for the better production of crops? Why did it need to have a subsidiary in India? The answer could be found in the company's focus on making maximum profits, more or less, regardless of the cost in environmental damage. As Larry Everest points out, there are instances when Union Carbide ignored safety issues and did not take proper measures to preempt possible disaster in order to maximize its profit by reducing the production cost. In other words, in the name of helping a developing country, the multinational corporation took advantage of cheap labor and an exploitable environment in India to augment its profit without any accountability. Union Carbide's operation in India can thus be regarded as what Rob Nixon calls the transnational offloading of risk from a privileged community to an impoverished one without direct transboundary shipment of toxic waste. Animals People depicts the impact of such indirect forms of pollution trade facilitated by new liberal globalization on the people and environment of a developing country. Sina points to the hollowness of the promise made by the American company when one of his characters, Gargi, asks the company lawyer, Mr. Lawyer, we lived in the shadow of your factory. You told us you were making medicine for the fields. You were making poisons to kill insects, but you killed us instead. I'd like to ask, was there ever much difference to you? Garg's remark evokes the promise of a green revolution that sought to increase the production of crops using chemicals and thus prepare the ground for the entry of the multinational chemical company into the country. Her sarcastic question to the lawyer shatters the post-colonial development imaginary that relied on pollution trade. Her conversation with the lawyer makes one aware of the fatal consequences of risk relocation from the north to the south and the indifference of the corporations towards the victims, in this case, the cough tourists. Sina is primarily concerned with the long-term effects of pollution trade on humans and the environment. He points to the slow violence caused by toxic wastes by depicting the life in cough for 20 years after the gas disaster. Animals describes the site of the company's factory at present in terms of nothing. He says, no bird song, no hoppers in the grass, no bee hums. Insects can't survive here. Wonderful poisons the company made. So good, it's impossible to get rid of them. After all these years, they're still doing their work. The poison does not remain confined to the site only, but rather contaminates the whole area. A young mother points to the widespread presence of poison throughout Kapoor when she says to Ellie Barber, the American doctor, our wells are full of poison. It's in the soil, water, in our blood. It's in our milk. Everything here is poisoned. Johnson succinctly sums up the pervasiveness of chemicals in the area by observing that from territories of soil to tributaries of blood, the factory's chemicals have produced a network of chemical contact that remains indiscernible within the atomistic and universal focus of human individuality. Animal's description of the factory site and the young mother's lament over the presence of poison in the environment and the human life depict how this network of chemical contact defies time. Paradoxically, the factory that promised to develop the country by increasing its crop yield now deprives nature of its natural productivity. The corporation disposes the land, the air, the water, and the fauna and flora of cough food of their ability to function properly and uninhibitedly. To undermine the ecological and biological damage inflicted by the multinational corporation, Western experts tended to situate the Bhopal tragedy in relation to a wider context. However, this context uh, does not take neocolonial entanglement into consideration, but rather sees the disaster in terms of a risk-benefit analysis which says that the possible harm of a technology must be weighed against economic and other kinds of payoffs. In his newspaper article published within a week of the disaster, 
broad depicts the outlook of such experts who prioritize economic outcome over life and the environment by stating that they say people should not worry over the slight probabilities of cancer from air pollution. For example, if the companies involved are generating jobs and profits. This observation by the Western experts once again reflects the presentist attitude of the discourse on pollution trade, which conceives of profit in terms of immediate economic gains without subtracting from it the present and future losses incurred by humans and the environment. Sina's depiction of the immediate and prolonged damage sustained by the people and the environment in the novel is a response to those Western supporters of pollution trade who seek to rationalize economic profits by diminishing the current and the long-term danger associated with it. Sina captures the past and the present experiences of the conquerors within the single frame of the novel to reveal the fallacy inherent in the notion of economic development gained through the dumping of toxic wastes in developing countries. Initially, the factory provided the people with employment opportunities, but it did not offer them any long-term protection against the adversity resulting from potential economic or environmental crisis. As a result, immediately after the accident, when the company stopped its operation in India and left the country without taking any responsibility, either for the accident or the havoc done to the humans and the environment in Kapoor, the poor had to pay the price for the corporation's trade with India. After who worked in the factory and survived the night, later found himself jobless and affected by the poisonous gas. He could not do any physical work because of his breathing problem caused by the gas. His wife spent all their savings and sold their house for Aftab's treatment, but without any effect. Now, after the death of Aftab, his wife Pierre lives with their two daughters, right by a stinking Nala. The small girls are always hungry and cry at night, but Pierre has nothing to give them to eat except water to fill their empty bellies. Pierre's story is not an isolated story, but rather, as animal asserts, the tale of thousands. The representative story of the poison victims points to a more alarming consequence of the disaster. At first, pollution trade stops development by arresting life, and subsequently, it paralyzes the economy of the developing country by disabling its working people and natural resources. In other words, by disposing humans and the nature of their ability to operate properly, then this neoliberal trade divests the poor country of its means of production, and hence leaves it impoverished not only at a given time, but also for the time to come. The transaction that rationalizes the exchange of toxic wastes of economic benefit, instead of bringing about material development, contributes to the future impoverishment of the poor and the destruction of the environment. Sina depicts how pollution trade, taking the advantage of neoliberal ideology, incapacitates the poor and the environment in the name of development. It is true that sometimes such trend trades provide the poor with employment opportunities for short term, but in the long run, they leave the majority impoverished and put them at the risk of environmental disaster. The multiple realities that Sina creates by situating the personal and collective past of the victims in relation to the present and future offer an understanding of multidimensional effects of pollution trade that the discourse on pollution trade fails to capture. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Bianca Tavites from the University of Zaragoza, Spain, and my presentation is entitled Caste, Gender and Resistance, the Evolution of Dalit Women's Identity in Bailey Campbell's The Prisons We Broke and Mina Kandasamy's The Gypsy Goddess. The caste structure in India has privileged the upper castes and disempowered the lower and outcast populations through a form of social stratification of hierarchically arranged strata. One is ascribed to a straighten by descent, thus leaving no scope of individual capabilities, inclinations or choices. This has led to the establishment of a pair of opposing counterparts of upper and lower castes and to the creation of a purity pollution polarity in the Indian mindset. The most notorious outcome of this dualism is the conception of untouchability vested in the Dalit communities and their subsequent otherizing. 
Yet casteism has not only divided individuals in terms of their descent and hierarchy, but has also created gender divisions that reinforce the former. Conversely, gender ideology in India has legitimated not only the patriarchal structure, but also the very organization of caste. Dalit author Baby Campbell extensively addresses this additional layer of discrimination to casteism and argues, quote, just as the Shatubana system created caste and sanctioned discriminatory practices, the cunning creator of the world established the practice of making women dependent on men. Men have therefore dominated women ever since, end of quote. The institution of caste has established a clear dichotomy, man versus woman, and has positioned Dalit women at the bottom of the three dominant power structures, namely caste, class, and patriarchy. As Dalit author Mina Kandasami reckons, quote, for man, the woman is the Dalit of the house, end of quote. As a result, Dalit women have unequivocally become the Dalits among the Dalits, suffering particular forms of oppression, both individually and collectively. The Indian patriarchal oppression has established a particular imagery of the good Indian women, according to which Hindu women had to cover themselves modestly and behave as proper chaste women. This image contrasted with that of low caste females who were portrayed as loud, uncuff, shameless, immoral, and flagrantly sexual figures, which strengthened Dalit women's devaluation and otherness. The image of Dalit women as loose led Dalit men to try to counter it by granting their women less liberty of movement and to assert control over their bodies, all done in an effort to restore Dalits, especially men's dignity. This progressively changed the perception of Dalit women from polluting and lascivious to silenced and vulnerable victims of a particular caste-based exploitation, which eventually allowed for conceptualization of the ideal Dalit women as a romanticized, submissive, and mute being, which largely resonated in literary productions. Moreover, the patriarchal social setup has conceptualized different gender roles for men and women. In this gender stereotyping, men have been assigned superior and decision-making roles, whereas women have been entrusted with the lowest and most undesirable occupations, both inside and outside the household, such as the processing of hides and leather, the removal of dead animals, scavenging, cutting hair, or laundry. The patriarchal social framework has definitely governed the Indian public sphere, yet life inside the home generally regarded as a safe and private space, rather than relaxing its codes, has revealed itself as equally brutal, unjust and oppressive as the one outside. Campbell attests to the violence inflicted on Dalit women, stemming from within the family and reinforcing the caste-based violence at the hands of upper caste, quote, the furious husband would beat her to a pulp with a stick and drive her out of the house. She was an easy prey, anybody could torture her as they wished." End of quote. There was also a strong social pressure to marry Dalit girls as soon as possible. The fear that they could be corrupted or harmed as long as they were still unmarried or occupied at school reinforced parents' preference for speedy marriages. Otherwise, both the family and the girl would be subjected to extreme criticism and dishonor, and the daughter in particular would be labeled as promiscuous. Moreover, recurrent instances of abductions, rape, molestation um, generated insecurity among Dalit girls and their families, and this further dampened the enthusiasm of both parents and girls in pursuing education beyond a, a certain age, which bounded girls to their homes. Once their life purpose of getting married was completed, Dalit women's predicament would not end. On the contrary, it would magnify. Akin to the principle of submission on the name of caste, the hegemonic gender ideology in India would make them accept their subservient position in marital relations as well. Campbell underscores the importance of being married and having a husband for Dalit women. Quote, we lay our lives at the feet of our husbands. We believe that if a woman has a husband, she has the whole world. If she does not have a husband, then the world holds nothing for her. End of quote. 
men's supremacy and female subjugation are not only shaped and reinforced by men, but also by women. The interplay of patriarchy and matriarchy in Indian society results in a renewed oppression of Dalit women. Once married, the female Dalit was subjected to yet another layer of abuse at the hands of her in-laws, particularly her mother-in-law. In India, the household is administered by the mother-in-law and all daughters-in-law must comply with her domination. As Campbell put it, quote, the other world has bounded, bound us with chains of slavery, but we too desired to dominate, to wield power, so we made our own arrangements to find slaves, our very own daughters-in-law, end of quote. Campbell epitomizes the objectification of daughters-in-law by arguing that, quote, she was not a human being for her in-laws, but just not a piece of wood, end of quote. As in the Dalit social sphere, one can appreciate a largely male-centric orientation in Dalit writings. They concentrate on the efforts of Dalit men and thus diminish or even exclude women's actions and aspirations. The proportion of representation of Dalit women's predicament in the works of male writers is insignificant. There are about only passing references to the ordeals endured by them, or as Gopal bluntly puts it, Dali women make only a guest appearance in them. When they do get represented, their image is distorted, romanticized, and heavily stereotyped. Apart from silent and silenced victims, Dali women have frequently been discursively constructed as victims of rape and sexual violence at the hands of both upper caste and Dali men on account of their body and beauty. This, apart from reducing Dalit women to a hyper-symbolic state of victimhood through images of collective violence, customary access, and expropriation of women's bodies, has also rendered them impure and lacking in virtue. Given this inadequate and silencing hegemonic rhetoric, the need was felt by women imbued with Dalit consciousness to represent their perspectives and lived experience in a genuine manner to make a creative use of their marginality from their outsider within status. Guru opened the debate on the use of difference for Dalit feminists, suggesting that Dalit women go through a differential experience shaped by um, contradiction between um, them and upper caste women, as well as the patriarchal domination within Dalit communities. This politics of difference structures the articulation of the specificity of Dalit women's lives their sexuality, political awareness, self-assertion, labor, violence, and suffering, they all justify their need to speak differently. Dali women writers' voices have emerged relatively late in the written literary uh, tra traditions, but that does not preclude them from being articulate and forceful. As is the case of the rest of Dalit literature, life narratives have become a discursive arena for Dalit women as it permitted them to represent the multi-layered problems and identities of Dalit women. Yet, apart from documenting their plight and everyday struggles, Dalit women writers are also developing, in the course of their weave, alternative expressive spaces where they can voice resistance and reimagine their representative norm. Their aim is to rescue female Dalit bodies from passive manipulations and build alternative feminist agentic imaginings. Dali women have learned through lifelong experience that they cannot control their milieu, but they certainly can control their individual actions. They have learned to use their instincts and their abilities to uncover ways so as to silently thwart the system. Campbell's The Prisons We Broke, for instance, is not only a revelation of the bitter reality of the social ills that Dali women confront, it also brings to light their inner strength and vigor. Campbell's narrative abounds with stories of Dali women who had the resilience and strength to negotiate their existence in a male-dominated society. It illustrates that even uneducated Dali women working as field laborers have cunningly created ways of interpreting and asserting their identities. They refuse to be consigned to a state of hopelessness. Instead, they strive to persevere. 
rather than focusing on describing and analyzing victimhood, Kandasami sheds light um, on the political engagement and agency of Dalit women. While Kandasami voices the trials and tribulations of Dalit women, she also depicts them as agents in bringing about change, both in their own lives and in the lives of other Dalit women. In the Gypsy Goddess, Dalit women are far from being silent subjects at the receiving end of humiliation. Instead, we see the emergence of a subject with critical agency who speaks up, writes out, and confronts outright. Precisely, Kandasami demonstrates that the new generation of married women is not willing to suffer as their elder generations did for hundreds of years. As Bella Malik argues, quote, the younger women are most militant and less willing to tolerate the terms of their resistance, end of quote. In her bold novel, Kandasami makes sure that Dali women's resilience and role in the fight for dignity and freedom is highlighted. The women she portrays dare to defy their oppressors, even at the risk of their own lives. In conclusion, the gendered nature of the caste system demonstrates that Dalit is far from being a homogeneous category with fixed and universal layers, layers of suffering. Rendered as silent, submissive and passive, the Dalit women have suffered from accentuated discrimination as the patriarchy ruling Indian society has added to the patriarchy that holds sway over Dalit households, as both Campbell and Kandasami especially lay bare in both of their texts. Patriarchy has also coalesced with matriarchy, a fierce combination that has left its mark, especially on the figure of the daughter-in-law. The patriarchal and matriarchal codification of caste has objectified and denigrated altogether the Dalit woman's body and has converted it in the repository of male power and control. By the same token, the essentialism of that project has legitimized narrow and gendered representations, which have depicted Dalit selfhood with a largely male-centric orientation and have rendered Dalit women invisible. They have only been guest appearances in Dalit texts, largely stereotyped as backward thinking, silent and submissive victims, a discursive determinism which further oppressed their bodies and selves. Against this failure to adequately engage with their predicament, Dali women have resolved to take hold of the pen themselves and reclaim the widening of the literary scope. Standing on the intersection of ethnicity, caste and gender, both Campbell and Kandasami not only present a different side of the story, but they also tell it differently, steered by their differential experience. They attempt a Dalit feminist recuperation of the castes and misogynistic narrative and the reimagination of the representative norm through both covert and offered agency and resistance. The mark of feminism in the voice and ideas of these writers is evident as most of the women portrayed in both the Gypsy, the Gypsy Goddess and The Prisons We Broke are unmistakably feminist without using or knowing the term in their rebellions and support for each other. And that's it. Thank you very much for listening and I hope you enjoyed uh, my presentation. My name is Chitra James. I'm a research scholar in National Institute of Technology, Calicut in India. I co-authored this paper with my supervisor, Dr. Reju Josh Matthew. Our paper is titled, Discriminatory Social Orders and Subaltern Assertion, a comparative study of resistance in selected Dalit and Burako literature. In this paper, we try to make a close cultural study of caste in Japan and India. The paper compares the Burakumin writer Nakagamis, the Cape and other stories from the Japanese Keto, and the Dalit literary work, The Gypsy Goddess, written by Meena Kandasami. Both these novels details the lived experiences of Dalit and Burakumin communities and their staunch resistance to feudal powers. Talking about caste in India and Japan, the Dalits of India and Burakumins of Japan have a shared history of caste discrimination 
that is based on the notion of ritual pollution by purity. In Indian society, the Chadurvarna system is the basis of caste stratification. According to this system, Brahmins, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas and Shudras have their origin from the Mahapurusha. The untouchable classes that include Dalits and tribals cannot claim their origin from the Mahapurusha. Their place is therefore outside the Varna system. This caste system is also sustained through traditional occupation. The Dalits of India are historically forced into menial jobs such as scavenging and jobs that are considered polluting such as butchering, burial of dead animals and tanning of animal hides. The discriminatory practices in Japan also show similar tendencies. Since the feudal period in Japan, the Burakumins were ostracized from the mainstream society. Jobs that were deemed as polluting were set aside for them. This included executing criminals, slaughtering and leather work. Under the Buddhist and Shintoist beliefs, these jobs that were associated with death and blood were marked as polluting. So Buddhism had a detrimental effect on the lives of the Buraku people. But for the Dalits of India who suffered discrimination under Brahmanism and the Varna system, Buddhism offered an egalitarian space. It is interesting to note that the lives of Dalits and Burakumins were affected in different ways by the Buddhist religion. But these communities have a shared history of discrimination, be it in the lack of any claims of heritage or discrimination in employment, education, in land ownership, then the poor housing and residential segregation and many others. Caste identity is also related to gender position. So women and people of marginalized genders within these communities face multiple levels of oppression. Many a time, the Buraku women were sold to prostitution or as sex slaves. And this can be paralleled with the Devadasi system in India. In contemporary times, these two outcast groups of India and Japan do recognize the shared forms of discrimination that they are subjected to. And they do not fail to extend political solidarity. One recent example is the 2018 Japan Convention that provided space for discussions on various issues that affect the outcast groups of India and Japan. This includes discussions on discrimination that these communities continue to face in employment, education, lack of access to land, etc. In fact, the slogan J. Beam J. Burakumin raised during this convention was immensely popular. Coming to Dalit and Buraku literature, as Dalit literature is a writing back to the mainstream Indian literature, Burakumin literature is writing back to the Japanese literature. While doing so, these literatures expose the ruptures in national narratives. One can find comparable patterns in these literatures, such as revealing the hegemonic structures of oppression, questioning them, celebrating identity assertion and resistance or narrating the lived experiences. Early writings of Dalit writers, early Dalit writings were mainly autobiographical, like Sharan Kumar Limbali's Akkamarshi that dealt with the pathos faced by the community. Although there are other writings that go beyond this, resistance and narration of lived experiences are important to Dalit literatures. Resistance takes various forms in Dalit literature, and it is not always an armed resistance, as in the case of the Malayali Dalit writer C. I. Yapan's stories. The novels under discussion are Meena Kandasami's The Gypsy Goddess and Nakagami Kenji's The Cape and Other Stories from the Japanese Ghetto. Both these works contain elements of historiographic metafiction. Meena Kandasami, as a Dalit activist and writer, and her Dalit identity is debated. Kandasami dealt with issues such as jatha, caste, and class. The Gypsy Goddess encompasses all, all these themes, and it, it is a work of postmodern fiction. Many works of 
Kenji Nakagami also carries elements of postmodernism such as self-reflexivity. Nakagami follows the Japanese tradition of Shisho Setsu fiction that is highly reflexive. Although Nakagami publicly declared his Buraku identity in 1981, he refused to use what that, that word in his fiction. Nakagami famously claimed that the Burakumin had a culture even though they were illiterate. Illiteracy is traditionally also associated with Dalits as they were kept away from the Sanskrit Brahminical systems of learning. Through his writings, Nakagami was trying to document the lived experiences of the outcast people who are seen as people without history or cultural heritage. While doing so, he gives voice to stigmatized women like prostitutes. As a writer who's traveled along the Kishu Peninsula to study the roots of discrimination, Nakagami's fictional works do justice in documenting the lived experiences of the outcast groups. Coming to the Gypsy Goddess, this novel details the predicament of landless Dalit agricultural laborers in the village of Kilvanmani in Tamil Nadu. The Dalit massacre discussed in the novel happened on Christmas Day, 1968. On that day, 44 Dalit agricultural laborers and their family members were locked inside a hut and burned alive by upper caste landlords for demanding higher wages. The novel was published in 2014, that is more than 40 years after the actual incident took place. During the time of the massacre, Kilvanmani was part of Thandro district, but now it belongs to Nagapattinam district. The novel opens with a quote from John Steinberg's The Grapes of Wrath. This epigraph connects the struggles and resistance of Dalit agricultural laborers in Kilvanmani to the more discussed American working class struggles during the period of the Great Depression. Also, by doing so, Kandasami proposes that Kilman money incident is primarily a class struggle. The author herself has stated that the incident is a class war more than anything else. But it is debatable considering the complex social fabric of India. And to identify a Dalit struggle as a class struggle would be unfair. As with the Dalit agricultural laborers of Kilman money, Experiences of caste and class are mostly intertwined. But that does not justify equating both the experiences. In revisiting Indava thought, stigma, labor, and the immanence of caste class, Anupama Rao talks about how the Dalit labor itself is devalued because the Dalit body is seen as impure and polluted. In a caste society, the untouchables are traditionally bound to do labors that are deemed polluting. So the labor and body of an untouchable is not valued as that of a working class in the capitalist relations of production. Ambedkar has argued that regulations on female sexuality or endogamy is a biopolitical aspect that differentiates caste from class. In his 1917 essay, Castes in India, their genesis, mechanism, and development, Ambedkar talks about caste as an enclosed class. Mm -hmm. Labor can be seen only as one of the many factors that contribute to the deprived state of Dalits. Kandasami recognizes this complex relationship between class and caste and questions the treatment of caste within Marxism. In the novel, we see embittered Dalit laborers who are made to believe that Marxism addresses caste issues. To believe that so we have a quote from the novel. These words are spoken by a Dalit laborer. We were told that Marx had written about this. We were told that because we worked with our hands, we were the working class. We were also told that because we worked and because they hated work, they hated us. In fact, the Communist Party of India, Marxist, identifies 
caste appeal as a threat leading to the fragmentation of working classes. But the Dalit laborers' fight in Kilwan Mani was led by communists, and the demands raised by these laborers addressed both caste and class issues. While the laborers demanded better wages and better working conditions, they also fought against untouchability and the barbaric punishments that were meted out against them. To conclude, although discrimination against Buraku people persists to this day, one cannot deny the positive changes that are happening in Japan. Increase in intermarriages between Buraku and non-Buraku people and decrease in residential segregation have been particularly helpful in this regard. Talking about caste endogamy, Ambedkar has pointed out that the problem of caste then ultimately resolves itself into one of repairing the disparity between the marriageable units of the two sexes within it. In fact, various positive discrimination measures and governmental policies have helped Buraku people in Japan. The activities of Buraku Liberation League and legal interventions such as Law on Special Measures for Buraku Improvement Project, 1969, as well as reforms in educational system to check discrimination have been helpful in improving the living standards of the Buraku people. But India runs far behind Japan with its positive discrimination measures getting diluted through various measures such as the implementation of reservation for economically weaker sessions. Such policy level interventions and those class rather than caste as the major determinant of reservation. The rise of Hindutva fundamentalism has also resulted in an increase in anti-Dalit crimes. The data of National Crime Records Bureau suggests that crimes against Dalits show a considerable increase during the tenure of the BJP-led NDA government. There is also a rise in honor killings over inter-caste marriages in India. Taking the example from Japan, more legal and policy interventions to address Dalit issues need to be implemented by the Indian government. And also, even as discrimination against these subaltern communities is continuing, more attention needs to be paid to their literary assertions. Thank you. Hello, 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 hello. Once, once again, everyone. And uh, thank you so much for joining us and for uh, listening to the presentations. presentations. Uh, I, I'm sorry that uh, I have to inform that one of the uh, uh, panelists has not been able to make it because of some technical issues. So um, we will not be able to take uh, Questions for Shifana Pia. She she couldn't join us, so we regret that. But we have, uh, as you can see, we have other panelists, so they're more than willing to uh, take questions and um, answer your questions. So I'm looking forward to a very lively discussion after the wonderful presentations. I have got uh, questions for everyone, but I think I'll um, I'll pick questions from from you, the audience, and kind of. Um, if uh, we still have time, then I can ask some questions of my own. So, uh, Bianca, if I can start with you, there is a question for you from Ma Margaret. So uh, she asks, have you made theoretical connections between other oppressed genders and social slash class identities? The work of queer feminist Chicana theorist Gloria Ansaldua strikes me as a very relevant uh, source. I think uh, she's referring to uh, La, Fronte La Frontera, Borderland, and so on. So would you like to respond to that? Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much, Margaret, for, for, uh, for your question. I've actually read numerous Tisa, but um, I haven't had the pleasure nor the time to, uh, to delve into it um, from a theoretical point of view. Um, I have a colleague of my own at my department that is working on on uh, this book for her PhD, but I haven't had the time nor the chance to to do it. So I'm, I'm so, so 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 sorry for that. But no. Great. Well, uh, if I can move on to Alamgir. Um, Alamgir, you have a question from uh, Trang Dang. 
She asks, asks uh, what has been happening regarding the Bhopal disaster and its uh, effects on the human and non-human victims? Reminds me of Timothy Morton's uh, concept of hyperobject. Uh, is this something that you engage in your research? or if And if so, do you find the concept helpful? Thank you, Purna, and thank you, Tran, uh, for pointing to this concept of hyperobjects. Um, I am not engaged directly with this notion of hyperobjects, but I'm uh, doing something with a closer uh, idea of, of the slow violence, um, as explained by Rob Nixon. But yes, uh, the, the, the thing that happened in Bhopal and uh, the aftermath of the incident certainly uh, conforms to what Timothy Martin calls hyperobjects. Now, uh, if you asked me about my particular research, uh, the presentation that I have done today, then you will see that the consequences of the violence uh, spreads across time. We cannot call it space as well because we are confined and limited to a particular space that Bhopal uh, Sinha is dealing with uh, these victims and their approaches uh, to this disaster, uh, their resistance. So in that case, uh, I would say that yes and no both, because as I told you, the consequences uh, is dispersed across time, but not space in that sense. But uh, if you ask me about my overall project and my PhD research that I'm doing, then yes, of course, yes, because I'm also dealing with the climate change and global warming. If we think about that, then certainly it uh, crosses the boundary of space and time as well. But Mostly, I'm interested in the locals uh, because if we uh, focus on the global too much, mm -hmm. it escapes our attention from the local, how the local people, the poor, uh, who are striving uh, to survive uh, the environmental and ecological disasters, how and what are they are doing in these circumstances. So, um, uh, as I have mentioned already, Yes and no, but I think uh, Timothy Morton's concept is will be really helpful when I'll be dealing with this climate change and global warming in one of my dissertation chapters. Uh, I hope this answers your question. It uh, definitely does. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I guess uh, Bianca Cherechez has a question for uh, Reggie, George, Matthew, and Chisira James. Uh, Bianca, would you like to ask your question? Uh, um, well, my question, I, I have two questions actually. Um, the first one is that um, I don't know if you if you sensed any uh, differences between the two communities, between the Dalits and uh, the other communities, because you talked about the similarities in your paper, but not about not so much about the uh, the differences. And I'm very much interested in that. And uh, the second question was um, if you notice any inter or inner divisions between uh, uh, the um, Rakum community. I, I I forgot the uh, the name because in the Dalit communities, uh, yeah, in the Dalit communities there are many inner uh, divisions that um, uh, strengthen their oppression. So yeah, that was that were my two questions. Thank you. Okay. Um, so. Um, to begin with, uh, we, we don't have uh, primary uh, data uh, when it comes to the Burakiman community. Uh, the interesting thing is that we were thinking of um, a comparative lit uh, literature paper also, uh, which could deal with uh, Dalit literature, which could involve Dalit literature. And that's how we came across uh, Burakiman literature. And then we were reading about it. Uh, so definitely, um, both the uh, questions would require us to explore further. Um, and it was, a, it was a tough task for us to get the translations even uh, to begin with. Uh, but the interesting aspect for us, I would say, is you know, more than the differences, the similarities would matter because the political solidarities between uh, the larger Dalit community and the Burakumin community is something which is very interesting. Another interesting aspect for us was also the fact that uh, uh, these kinds of solidarities internationally can also lead to uh, more feasible solutions. So, 
uh, the you know several reports are there on how the Rakhman community has in some way or the other say overcome uh, discriminatory practices to an extent. So that's something which is interesting for us, uh, you know, how we can learn from uh, such an experience and uh, the government intervention, uh, for instance, in Japan. Uh, whereas uh, the political scenario in India is quite different and uh, in, in many ways disappointing that uh, such things are not possible. Uh, Purna is agreeing with me, I guess I can uh, see from his smile. Uh, so so that's, where, uh, that's where we stand right now. So I'm, I'm really sorry, but uh, I can't explain any further uh, because uh, personally I have worked on Dalit literature. Uh, my uh, co-author uh, Chitra is also dealing with it uh, for her research uh, to an extent. But we are yet to go uh, and explore Burakuman community uh, in detail. So that's uh, that's that's uh, our limitation. We know uh, that's our limitation uh, as a writer. But uh, but I think it's fascinating to see these solidarities. Uh, for instance, um, I came across a report that spoke about uh, uh, say leather work. about how so it's 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 more about how this particular occupation dealing with leather uh, uh, has traditionally been associated with some kind of uh, pollution uh, or impurity in both these uh, societies uh, so there are such things happening but uh, this question about internal divisions amongst burakumin again we are uh, not yet there so hopefully we are uh, assuming that we can explore it uh, a bit uh, further, um, then when it comes to religion, uh, we do have uh, certain differences. For instance, uh, there are references on how the Burakumin could have their own temples, whereas uh, when it comes to India and the Dalit scenario, uh, Dalit gods have traditionally been uh, identified as, um, say, uh, smaller gods or you know if you look at the works of uh, Kanja Eleya for instance uh, so such references are there so you don't have the upper caste uh, worshipping the Dalit gods uh, so so that kind of differences are definitely there but as I said uh, our interest is more on the political solidarity angle so yeah we will definitely work on it but how is something that I can't uh, uh, you know, understand yes. right now yeah yeah, thank, thank you, thank you very much. Because um, yeah, that it uh, it was new to me. Uh, I know that there are some um, quote unquote untouchable communities that exist in uh, who exist in um, some African countries, like you know the Osu people uh, in the Igbo community, which we kind of find reference in the God of, uh, in um, in uh, things fall apart and so on. But yeah, it's interesting that to kind of uh, see the comparison and uh, differences. Bianca, you have a question from uh, Valentina Driso. She thanks you for your presentation. Uh, she asks, uh, you use autobiographical and fictional texts in your research. Do you find any particular strength to these uh, different genres? Or do you find the, the boundaries of genres are blurred? Thank you very much, Valentina, for your question. Um, I think they're actually blurred. Um, I would say that autobiographies uh, have more strength and are more raw, so to speak. Uh, but it's true that fictional works, Dalit fictional works, are also very much um, stressing facts and realities. Um, so they, they, uh, I think that they want to make sure that fiction do not um, eclipse facts and reality. So I, I think that although autobiographies are more um, stick more to the facts, fiction uh, is also very much um, um, interested in that. So I think that they are blurred, actually. I don't think that there is very much difference between autobiographies and, and fictional works, at least from what I've been experiencing. Good. Uh, uh, Alamgir, you have a question from um, uh, Margaret. Uh, she asks, it seems that the uh, 
trope of affect is central to animals people do you think the novel uses it to elicit uh, responses and responsibility from readers thank you margaret uh, yes absolutely um if we just look uh, at the characters we'll see that jaffer um, the rebel in the novel who is not a victim of the disaster but still he is with the victims he is trying to get justice now um you specifically have asked about uh, the responsibility and responses from the readers i would add to this that the novelist probably was trying to uh, elicit responses from the characters the fictional characters as well uh, jaffer is one of the examples and uh, uh, i would like to add that that this book the whole book could be could be regarded as a temporal resistance to this kind of disaster now in what sense in in the, in the novel jaffer writes the book that categorically explains the night of the disaster but his intention is that sometime later the new generation will be able to read the book and they will be able to understand what happened uh, at that night and they will be able to resist a future as uh, any kind of uh, attempt to establish this kind of chemical plants in india or anywhere else so uh, the readers i would not consider only the present reader i consider it like the next generation the readers to come not only in india but internationally because um, you know that uh, there were uh, several movements against this kind of disaster and there were some uh, attempts to help the victims as well even in the uk so yes i agree with you that this trope of effect that pasin has used in his novel certainly is intended to draw people to form a sort of relationality connections among people across regions so that anywhere in the world they can resist any sort of uh, attempt to have this chemical nuclear plants that has the potential to endanger the lives of humans and plants uh, i hope uh, this answers the question yes yes it does it definitely does uh, we have a question from nicole thiera uh, for um, reju george matthew and cicero james she asks uh, uh, this is an exciting literary comparison the comparison that you have done, done in the uh, presentation could you tell us more about what the comparison of these literary traditions dalit and burakam can offer what more can they offer uh, the comparisons that is what i suppose is a question okay uh, so uh, we see that um, uh both dalit literature and burakamin literature they have uh, been studied in the post colonial uh light and uh, when you look at that you know when you think about say the um, uh, the empire writing back mm -hmm. uh, so we have that kind of uh, that kind of a uh, uh, comparison possible where both dalit literature writing back to say indian uh, literature so called uh, larger uh, indian literature which is uh, probably upper caste literature or hindu literature or brahmanical literature in some sense or the other and we also have the burakamin literature uh, exposing i would say uh, an underbelly of uh, japanese uh, society which we, which we probably uh, wouldn't have uh, realized otherwise so uh in in that sense uh, both these uh, literary traditions have been identified as writing back to the oppressors uh, mm -hmm. that's that's one thing then if you look at the the way uh, the manner in which uh, lives have been described uh, or uh, the manner in which themes have been uh, engaged with uh, in both these uh, literary movements uh, literatures you could see that uh, we have uh, like um, a discussion or engagement of uh, uh, of pain and uh, questions about human dignity and uh, questions about um, the, the place itself like we have for instance in uh, burakamin literature uh, in in our case in in, in the no novella cape we have them talking about the 
the Roji, the uh, the alleys where the Burakumin live, which is um, outside the the city space, the accepted uh, space. And we have the uh, Dalit literature also talking about this kind of uh, uh, um, uh, say uh, a segregated space, uh, for instance, for Dalits in the traditional Indian villages. So mm-hmm. we have several such themes. Uh, I guess it's 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 this um, lived experience um, of both these communities, uh, you know, that uh, that led to these kinds of politics political solidarities as well. Because, uh, for instance, in India, we have uh, traditionally, we have had Dalit writers and Dalit, um, those who do Dalit studies, they have always been influenced by black literature or African literature, as uh, Puna was uh, mentioning. So uh, so we, we have had such influences. So we are expanding on that. And I think uh, the, the, the fact that uh, when we look at occupations, for instance, uh, many of these traditional, uh, so-called traditional or caste-based uh, tradi- um, occupations that were part of the Dalit uh, communities, uh, like butchery and uh, farming and uh, carpentry and such things. So we have similar things being mentioned in Burakumil literature as well. Uh, so people who were traditionally performing the uh, the impure uh, you know, uh, roles in the society. Uh, so I guess in that sense, uh, there can be further research. Uh, but uh, obviously, there is uh, a lot of evolution that has uh, happened. And uh, the, the particular text that we have taken is from 1976. So mm-hmm. definitely things have changed. Uh, I'm talking about uh, uh, the Cape. Uh, so it's from 1976. So things have changed. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Meena Kandasamy's text is a recent one from 2014. So uh, that talks about, uh, again, that talks about uh, 19, an incident from 1968 where um, Dalits faced atrocities uh, at the hands of the upper caste uh, in, in, in a particular place. So uh, in, in many ways, we have uh, at the experiential level, we have a lot of uh, similarities uh, and the way the communities have uh, looked at it, uh, for instance, in Cape, we have the protagonist uh, kind of uh, accepting or um, the, the, the notion of this impurity of blood, for instance, gets into the mind of the protagonist. Yeah. And, uh, so, so there are such things. Uh, so such. So that's why the discussion of, say, dignity or self-respect would become important because uh, so I guess uh, in in that manner we could ex- uh, explore these two literatures. We can study these liter- traditions, uh, you know, one against the other. So I guess uh, that's what we can probably do. And uh, it's also interesting that we don't get to read Burakumin literature, uh, even if we have, say, some Japanese literature in translation, uh, mm-hmm. say, in Indian universities. So we never get to read uh, Burakumin literature too. So. I guess uh, that calls for some attention. Great. Well, Nicole Sierra also has a question for Bianca. So uh, she thanks you. Uh, then she asks, uh, do you think Dalit women can eventually free themselves of what happens to them? And uh, are there ways for others, outsiders, I think she's referring to researchers as well, to support these women? Thank you very much, Nicole. It's very nice to see you here. Um, I think that with the new political situation in India, oppression against Dalit and against Dalit women um, has changed, has not so much shifted, but changed. Um, and um, they are being oppressed um, in many new ways. Um, so I think that they um, have freed themselves from, from some oppressive mechanisms, but they have been... Um, they are still facing old ones, some old ones, and I think that they have been uh, dragged into new mechanisms. Uh, so they have to, to cope with, with those new mechanisms. Um, and in terms of the, uh, the second question, if um, um, outsiders uh, can help them, I think that that's a very difficult um, uh, matter. Um, I mean, just from the distance, there is very little that you can do. There's very little that I can do as a, as a young researcher. But 
I think that just by drawing attention um, to it is one way of helping their cause and um, um, I don't know, make them be known, make be known a little bit. That's little that we can do, but it's it's something. Definitely yes, uh, I agree with you, um, Bianca, on that. <laughs> Now we have a question for uh, Mama Dalam Girosen from Dani Olvo. She, she thanks you for your presentation. Then she asks, um, does animals people detail and uh, address ways in which communities affected by Vopal disaster deal with hazardous and toxic uh, waste? Thank you, Dani. Um, I guess no. Sina does not elaborate on the ways uh, these victims deal with these hazards and toxic waste. But what he primarily focuses on is how these victims deal with the consequences of the hazards and toxic wastes. Now, uh, if we see in the novel, the characters try to avoid uh, the place, the space where the factory was established because it still has uh, that hazards. Um, so they're just trying to avoid that place. That's it. But uh, what they are doing, they're doing, doing they're trying to get justice they're trying to define or redefine development in their own term, and then they're trying to achieve to that development. So uh, probably Sina was not as much concerned with dealing with these uh, remaining toxic wastes as he was concerned with how to survive the aftermath of these kind of disasters. Um, this is my take on, on this novel. Right, OK. Uh, then we have a question from uh, Bethan Evans for Bianca. She asks, asks uh, is the oppressive matriarchy in the uh, family unit a generational issue? Were the mother-in-laws uh, once the doubly marginalized uh, daughter-in-laws? Well, I do think that it's a generational, generational issue because um, I do sense that in some of the, uh, of the latest um, writings um, from Dalit uh, women, they do not tackle so much that, uh, that issue of, of the oppression coming from, from the in-laws, especially from the mother-in-law. Um, but I, um, I, I do think that it's a generational issue, but they do replicate mother in, mother in, mother in law, sorry, sorry, uh, they do replicate it, uh, what they have seen and what they have lived through. Um, well, just as the, the, the rest of the Dalit communities. Um, and by that, I mean that um, that was the mother's operandi. I mean, I'm oppressed, but I also oppress in, in turn. So, yeah. Yes, thank you for the, for that answer. Uh, I have a question of my own own for uh, Mohammed Alam Gir Hussain. Uh, basically, we uh, the disaster is as I said, it was a, wait, a disaster that was waiting to happen, and the kind of um, treatment of the uh, company, you know, treating people as disposable people and so on. I mean, literature we read uh, literature, but are there other kind of uh, cultural production that deal with the, this kind of silence? I mean, I, I think I, uh, there are some Bollywood movies. I think there is a movie by KK Men on, uh, called uh, Bhopal Express. And then there is another one, Bhopal Praying for Rain, I think, by, um, by Raj Yadav. Are there movies or other forms of cultural production that address uh, the silence, I would say? Um, thank you, Purna. Um, at this moment, I cannot recollect any other movie. But what I can remember, uh, I think a Pakistani documentary, I forgot the title, that was trying to depict, uh, as you have said, disposition, or uh, just getting rid of uh, this kind of people who are of no use now, uh, especially the workers who are dealing in a ship breaking yard. Um, and uh, so far, I remember, remember uh, the producer or the director, they tried to capture the whole ship in a way that it took uh, a longer period of time to show the whole ship. And what it was meant to represent is the slow, uh, slow damage that the workers are suffering from working in that kind of environment, um, uh, an unhygienic environment. So that's the only documentary that I remember right now, although I don't remember the name. Other than this, about Bollywood movies, no, I, I have no idea. <laughs> that's okay. Um... 
Bianca, there is a question for you. Would you like to take it uh, from uh, again from Nicole? I think um, I think it's about the narrative style, and I, I think I can combine this uh, Nicole's question with my question as well. In the presentation, you do talk about forms and uh, narrative structure and so on. So she asks, uh, uh, could you? Could you talk a bit more about the two text narrative style and how it contributes to the text feminist resistance? To which I would also like to add as to how I mean Dalit Dalit language is also kind of um, kind of um, um, said that it is very kind of impolite language and so on. You know, riddled with them, with all kind of expletive words and so on. So yes, if you can just kind of combinedly address that. Um, yeah, I mean, I. I well, um, Campbell and, and kind of Sami, they do belong to different generations. And uh, uh, it's true that Kanda Sami is, is bolder than, than Campbell, I think, in the way she writes and uh, the language she uses. Um, the, the very structure of, of Kanda Sami's books, books, it, books sorry, is just um, outrageous, so to speak, for, for the mainstream. It's not um, uh, the typical structure that, that you... Um, you thought you, you you were going to to encounter, um, and um, in in Campbell's um, text, for example, she's also bold, but not so much as Kandasami, or at least not in a very visual way. Um, and I'm not sure if that's because of the generation, the uh, the difference in the generation, or or just because of her personal um, uh, writing style. Um, but in terms of the language, for example, I do think that Campbell is, is bolder than Kandasami. Uh, she uses uh, more impolite words and um, she dares to address the, uh, the reader, and the upper caste, um, and also the, uh, the, the male counterparts, Dalit males. Uh, so just by addressing them, just by daring to address them, I think that she, she's very bold and um, she stresses the, uh, the feminist uh, resistance. So I do think that they are, um, they, they show the feminist re resistance in different ways. Um, maybe Kandasami more in a, in a narrative style in the, in the structure of, of her text and Campbell um, in the issues that she addresses, but also in the language and the vocabulary she uses. Interesting. Uh, there is a question for you, Alamgir. Uh, from Valentina Dirichos, she asks, uh, "How is pain represented or represented, represented slash mobilized in the text? Are impoverished communities uh, afforded a space to grieve?" Thank you, Valentina. Uh, I would like to begin with the last part of your question: Are impoverished communities afforded a space to grieve? Yes, um, they uh, have space to grieve. Uh, just if we look at the character Somra's Nisha, Nisha's father, who used to be a very good singer, renowned singer uh, before the disaster, but who lost his voice after the disaster. Now what he does, he has created his own space to suffer uh, his loss, the loss of wife, loss of child, and the loss of voice. Now uh, this uh, connects to the first part of your question, how is pain mobilized or represented? Pain uh, in the novel is represented, of course, as a springboard for action. This is not just to uh, stay with passively, but rather this can motivate characters to do something that could uh, mitigate their pain, not only physical pain, but the psychological and mental pain. And based on this pain, the characters find themselves connected, a group, a collective, that is trying uh, to resist the American company. Uh, so uh, yes, they have their own spaces uh, to give vent to their pain. At the same time, the same pain mobilize their action. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Alamgir, for that answer. I think, I think that's a nice uh, way of kind of wrapping up the session because as the, as the kind of this panel was titled, it was it was dealt with the uh, marginalization, but as, as a small tip to a step towards building the bridge. I think the kind of uh, transnational uh, panel that we have from Spain to India to USA and so on. I think it's a small step towards building the bridges. Uh, 
in 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 many ways. And um, you know, the oppressed communities, as I said, I mean, they're always they're not always oppressed. They they have these narrative forms, these stories, these novels, uh, and all these uh, forms to kind of uh, contest and um, write against the forms of oppression. So in that way, thank you so much uh, for all your papers and uh, for addressing all the uh, questions so wonderfully. Uh, and thank you all of you uh, for joining us and for asking all the wonderful questions. Um, and uh, yes, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I have an announcement to make. Uh, at uh, 1.30, we have the next panel. Uh, Yes, uh, titled uh, Environmentalism, Conservatism and Decolonization. Please uh, do join us uh, for that session as well. And I invite the panelists as well to kind of uh, to please uh, do join us uh, for that session as well. And um, thank you so much for joining us. And you, you have a nice day. Nice day. You too. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.